Well, when Sandra Ewan McKay was diagnosed with schizophrenia, mental illness was not something people talked about terribly openly. And today, 35 years later, it's a little more out in the open. The stigma, though, can still be felt. There is more discussion. There's more understanding. There is less fear. And that's because of people like Sandra. And tonight, Sandra Ewan McKay is one of three panelists who is going to share their experience of living with mental illness in front of a crowd at SFU's Gold Corp Center for the Arts. It is the second volume in a six-part series called Me Too, Stories of Courage, Strength, and Community in the Face of Mental Illness. And Sandra, you and McKay has been good enough to join us now in Studio 10. How are you? Fine. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for being here. When you first started showing signs of illness, you were, well, you were a teenager. What was that time like for you? Yeah, I was 14. 14 years I old. I was very shy at that time. And when I started to hear voices, I thought there were people outside of the house. I thought I was being spied on, that uh, people were after me. And it, it, it progressed from there and got worse. And, and did, did you or your family have any understanding of what was happening to you? Not really at all. My family, we had no family history of schizophrenia that we knew about. For me, I didn't even know what an auditory hallucination was. When I was diagnosed, um, I asked my psychiatrist, you know, what is this? And um, Mm -hmm. I really had no clue about what it was all about. And so this is 1980. Um, What kinds of supports were there back then for people who were living with schizophrenia? Um, I saw a private psychiatrist, but mm-hmm. there I also went to a group for uh, troubled teens. But they didn't have things around coping strategies, around education, around mental illness. So I learned to have insight into my delusions or hallucinations. They didn't have a lot of the um, supports around housing and things like that. So it has improved, but we still have ways to go. So when you're talking about going to a, a, a psychiatrist, what sort of advice were they giving you? How were they trying to treat you? Initially, uh, it was basically a talk therapy. You know, I came in, shared my feelings, um, and sort of got, okay, how is your medication? Go, you're 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 good to go. But mm-hmm. really, um, when after my, I had another major relapse much later on in 1998, and I was re-diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, which is a combination of schizophrenia and a mood disorder. And at that point, I really had to change how I did how I did things and how I viewed myself in order to improve. And, and so, tell me about that, that struggle or that journey. How did you change things? Yeah. So I really had to change my outlook. I had to change um, how I uh, thought about myself. I had to make um, efforts to um, get involved with the community, um, reach out and, and ask for help. You then started, you took up painting. (laughs) Yes. And <laughs> which is kind of why you're here today. But <laughs> what did you find in, in the art that you couldn't find elsewhere? Art was really healing for me. I mean, when you're in the zone and you're painting, you, you can express things you can't do through words. It's all about color. It's about, you know, healing. It's about being proud of actually being able to create something on a, on a canvas. And tell me about what you started painting. What did it look like when you started? Okay, when I was younger, you know, at Langara College, I took their fine arts diploma program. I painted a lot of psychological portraits, you know, with, you know, you walk past the painting and the eyes are following you and there's sort of the sinister, sinister, quality, sinister quality to hmm. it. But later on, you could see a real um, diversity in art. I had sort of like the yin-yang, sort of the really dark edge to it, but also very positive in the color choice. And now, you know, being more academically trained as an artist, my art has changed has changed again. Could you look at a painting and, th- and, and think back to, and that must have been a bad day. Yeah, right. <laughs> Can <Exactly>. you? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but did, did your art, did it change then as your relationship or your understanding of your illness change? Um, really drastically. I mean, I've, I've gone to a lot of um, workshops such as uh, Bridges or the Wellness Recovery Action Plan. I learned about cognitive behavioral therapy. I use mindfulness. I use exercise, um, you know, have a lot of support from my family, uh, make sure, you know, I'm getting enough sleep, that sort of thing, <laughs> take my medication. So it's a lot of self-care involved to keep well. That's my full-time job is to keep well. Mm-hmm. And how tough is that to do? Okay. It can be really... Um, uh, a roller coaster, like you know, you might have a few good weeks, and then you have you have a dip, you have a setback. You got to relearn those tools to pull out those wellness tools and and get back in the game and just try to keep going. And, and so, tell me then, what life is like for you today, on average? As you said, I mean, there are there are good times and there are not so good times. Do you still suffer from delusions? Do you still hear voices? Yeah, I think it's really a lot different than when I started because now I have a lot of people in my life who really believe in me and they support me. I've got you know artist friends. I've got 
people with mental illness that I can speak to, have you know, peer support between us. Um, I'm able to give back to the community through um, advocating and public speaking and being a director on the Coast Foundation Society Board. Mm. And I'm also able to um, speak out and really kind of send a message that there is hope for people like myself who started feeling very, very self-stigmatized and moved on to, to be successful. Now, tell me more about that, because there's this huge effort for people to try to uh, defeat the stigma of mental illness. But when you are, as you just said, self-stigmatized, how do you deal with that? You really have to search really deep. Um, you know, when I stand up in front of a group and I give it talk about my recovery story and they actually applaud me or they give me the courage to come back for it. It's, it really kind of reels in your mind, you know, maybe it's really not that bad. And when you see, you know, I was, when I wrote my book about my journey, my memoir, my schizophrenic life, I really saw that there was a pattern. It wasn't all that bad. It was, there was some real positives in my life, like getting married to a very wonderful person who's supportive or, you know, or publishing a book or mm. selling my first painting. So if you see things in a more positive light, you see my, if I see myself in a more positive light, um, I'm able to do a lot more and it breaks down a lot of barriers. And, and does the stigma feel the same as having someone else stigmatize you because of your illness? I mean, is it, are, you, are you doing that to yourself and is the feeling the same? Um, I think I really um, had a lot of self-pity. I felt a lot of self-blame or guilt that I had brought this upon myself. Uh, but the more I learned about it, it being a you know, biological disease, specifically, and mm -hmm. also, you know, feedback from other people. I mean, public opinion is public opinion. That's why these talks are so important to give, because I think it gives people a more multidimensional view of the individual. And they're not just looking at the illness, they're looking at that person as a person. And, and when you see these campaigns, and we've seen, I think it's Bell Media doing one recently, uh, where uh, we're taught people who who are, are exposed to mental illness are taught about a, a certain way of dealing with people who might be suffering from some sort of mental illness. Um, are they instructive? Is, is it good for the population that doesn't suffer from mental illness to uh, be instructed like that? I think it's really important to have compassion for um, other, you know, stigmatized um, p persons of a particular race, mm -hmm. uh, if they're transgender, their sexual orientation, um, or if they're not educated or they're homeless, I think we make a lot of judgments. And I think mental illness is somewhere, you know, we've had, this, it, we've had a rough ride, you know, there's violence in the media, there's suicides in the media, what can we say? Mm -hmm. But for me, you know, personally, I'm not a violent person. Um, I thought about suicide, but never attempted it. And I think there's people out there who are not the stereotypical thing you see in the news sometimes. It's a big range. Yeah. Sandra, it's great to meet you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Sandra Ewan McKay, an artist and the author of My Schizophrenic Life, The Road to Recovery from Mental Illness. She is speaking tonight as part of a VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation event called Me Too, Volume 2. This is the second of six panel conversations between people living with mental illness. It gets underway at 7 o'clock at the SFU Gold Corp Center for the Arts. The event is free to the public. Few seats left, so if you want to go, you probably want to aim to get get there uh, by about 6 o'clock when the doors open. And if you can't attend, uh, the show is going to be taped and it'll be put up on YouTube tomorrow. You'll find more information about it all at vghfoundation.ca.